Hello. Uh, I'm glad that so many of you are here uh, because I think this talk is really important. It's about security, and there is not so many talks about security on this conference. Uh, my name is Tomasz Rubel. I'm senior developer in uh, Asego Poland. So let's start with application security beyond top 10 vulnerabilities. Some of you may guess that the title of this presentation refers to OWASP top 10 report. Yes, it does. Uh, just a reminder, OWASP, non-profit organization, focusing on improving security, mostly famous for OWASP top 10 report, most critical web application security risk, which is published every four years. Uh, we are due a new report, end of this year, but current report is still from 2017. And this is comparison between current report from 2017 and the previous report from 2013. In IT world, four years is a lot of time. Back in 2017, we were in Java 11. In 2013, Java 7. In frontend world, now we are Angular 12. Back in 2017, it was Angular 4 and 5. And back in 2013, Angular JS 1.2. So while in IT world in general, four years is a lot of time, if you look at the security, well, not so much. There are still the same bugs over the years, and eight out of 10 bugs and problems from 2018 are still in the current report. So why could be the case? In my opinion, this report is more, could be more helpful to an attacker than developer creating secure software. So why OWASP top 10 is not enough? So first of all, it just focus on the ne negative things not to do. Uh, we've seen that same books happens over the years, despite that based on this report, uh, a lot of developers and IT companies and co IT contracts are basing their security. And another point is that, in my opinion, nowadays development is fast, maybe a bit too fast. If this is security, trying to chase the, just to make sure that application is secure, development is running, running fast. And speaking of development, let's have a look at software lifecycle. So it doesn't matter if you use the old way, the, the waterfall or agile, the security testing usually happens on the very end, on the nearly ready to go for the production application. But when the application is actually ready, what about the maintenance, new features? So our security is in trouble. Also, another point is that a problem, that is uh, the security problem, which is found here in, during the testing, but if the problem is related to the something which happens on the early coding or even design, fixing this could be very, uh, the cost of it could be, very, could be very high. And speaking of testing, the typical black box approach is often not enough. So in a black box approach, the security tester has an input and see the output of the application, but what's happening inside within the application, he doesn't know. And if we think about security and development team, they wouldn't talk to each other. So development will do their own work, security will find something, they will come back to the development, and they will fix it. But what's the better way of coming to testing is a white box approach, when the security tester is not, doesn't have only input and output, but can see what's going on inside can see the algorithms, the scenarios, and this way he can find all the scenarios for possible bugs. And this can lead to cooperation between the development team and the testing team, uh, which is very helpful and could be very proactive for the application. Uh, so OWASP doesn't only publish top 10 reports. There are other documents that are very helpful. So one of them is OWASP proactive controls. It's primary for developers, so it provides awareness for building software security, uh, secure software. It's a good foundation for trainings for developers, and it focuses on defensive techniques. So have a look inside the document. Uh, chapter 5 speaks about 
validating of inputs. So first of all, inputs validation has to be done on the server for security. Uh, in regard to syntax and semantic validity, we should check if the data is in expected length and form. So like numeric IDs, enumerators values have to come through the domain of enumerator, dates, etc. And often regular expressions are used. But as regular expressions are very powerful, they can cause troubles. And here's an example of a real-world uh, email validation, regular expression, taken from a forum group. And here's an email address, simple email address, one match found, everything is fine. But if I remove add symbol, this email address is not valid anymore. But you can see number of steps. To validate the simple string, it took nearly 550,000 uh, steps. If I add more characters into it, the number increases. And with 19 characters, we are with nearly half a second to check that, to test that 19 characters possible email address. And it's taking nearly 1 million steps. With 20 characters, this, uh, this uh, application actually stops because there's over a million steps to check it. And this can lead on our servers to something which is called redos, which is a regular expression denial of service, which means that regular expression is so heavy that it's taking, draining the resources of the server, and the server stop responding. So why it happened here? Here we've got groups of groups, which means that when the regular expression cannot find a match, it tries all possible combinations. So with 20 characters in one group, two groups with 10 characters each, four groups with five characters each, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what we could do about it? First of all, avoid regular expression because they are heavy. But if you need to use regular expression, make sure that you understand what they are doing. And coming back to our proactive controls, this chapter also says that about using sanitizers. So to sanitize the inputs. But don't use anything on your own. Use something which is provided by a library or a framework, like DOM Purify or Java HTML Sanitizer. And speaking of inputs from a user, it's also worth to mentioning mass assignment or auto-binding. So attributes sent to the server by XML or JSON are often mapped to an object. So here we have an old GitHub registration form, which, is, uh, which used to be available publicly. So you can imagine that these three fields are mapped, could be mapped to such a JSON. But what if attacker extend this JSON and add account ID, activate this user, and if that's not enough, he can be also an admin. And I show in GitHub here because they had this problem. So basically, with a public available form, you can add a new user and assign it to an existing ID and have an access as an admin, even including private repos. So what to do about it? So as the developers, we need to whitelist the input and to allow only fields in, this, in a, such a request, like a registration form, that should be only passed into and not additional parameters. And there are other interesting uh, documents from OWASP. Another one is Cheat Series. It's a mature OWASP project. It, whoop, it includes over uh, 60 data, uh, data sheets with security, different security topics. And it's a good starting point uh, with a new technology. So let's say if you're introducing uh, JOT tokens to your application or you're introducing content security policy to your website, it's a good starting point and it has references for further reading. So the serialization cheat sheet, what it's actually give us, it gives us a guide to, uh, how to safely deserialize objects. So first of all, it has a language agnostic methods, then a specific guidance for each language, and then tools. And the last document I want to mention is application security verification standard. And here are some quotes from this document. So basically, uh, uh, courses on security are often only just ethical hacking courses and doesn't include too much information about secure coding for developers. And this probably doesn't help developers too much. And instead, this document is focused on the proactive controls rather than negative things not to do. 
Uh, this document is also a great blueprint if you want to use your own, build your own security checklist. So have a look inside, in chapter five. Uh, so every point in this, in this document is divided into three levels, level one, two, and three. So level one, which is any application, level two, uh, mid applications with, let's say, sensitive data in them, and level three is for critical applications. So let's see some points. So for any application, you should validate input coming into the application using positive validation whitelisting. And from level two, you should make sure that we, you, you prevent against integer overflows. Uh, just coming back to the whitelist, uh, also called positive validation or allowed list, why to use whitelist instead of a blacklist, which is blocking what we don't allow? Uh, I'm going to use a story from Polish pen tester Michał Bentkowski, um, who found XSS in Google Kaha. Google Kaha is an old sandbox uh, that uh, to run script safely without accessing the main window object. And, and this is how, and Google Kaha used black box to don't allow, uh, one of the things was not to allow to access main window object. And Michal found that you couldn't use just a window, but if you code at least one of those characters in word window with UTF-8, you will get access to the, to the window object. So he reported this to Google, they fixed it, they, they proved their blacklist, and it was fine, although wasn't it. Uh, but a few months later, ECMAScript 6 came in, and ECMAScript 6 is allowed to code UTF-8 with curly brackets. Michal have checked this, there was still a problem, he reported this to Google, they fixed it. In fact, Michal found pretty much the same thing three times and was paid the back bounty from Google three times. You can read it on his blog in details. And another thing, which is chapter 12 from ASFS, is how to deal with files and resources. And here are some examples of that. So any application should make sure that when, you, when a user uploads the file, it's not large enough to fill up the storage, because then the server will stop responding. And from level two, you should make sure that if you decompress uh, archives on the server, you should you are protected against zip bombs. And what is a zip bomb? I'll show you the in this on an example of 42 zip bomb, which is a tiny 42 kilobytes file that contains, if you decompress it, 16 zip files, which, and each of them contains 16 zip files, and each contains 16 zip files, and each of them, guess what? And and on the end, you've got one, each, in each of them, you've got one file which is 4.3 gigabytes. And when your server tries to decompress it recursively, you're ending up with 4.5 petabytes. And there's not many servers that can handle this. But also, if you think about security guy, I don't know if any security guy will be brave enough to try it on, on the production when he's testing an application, or even on the test environment, because if the application is, uh, is not protected against the zip bomb, the environment will go down. So zips should be handled with care. So to wrap it up, application security depends on all of us. Don't blame everything about security on security testers. Be aware as a developer. And please constantly improve your security awareness. Stay safe, and thank you. I hope it was helpful. Uh, I've got one minute left. If there are any questions, if they aren't, I'm here all day today and tomorrow, so feel free to catch me. And remember to vote if you like the if you like the my, my speech. If you didn't like it, please don't vote. Thank you.